Good evening, Brantford. Pastor Mark here at Brant Naz, the Brantford Church of the Nazarene, as we are uh, back to our midweek uh, uh, study of the Word, the, the Scriptures, the Bible, in our Exploring God series. Where for the past number of weeks, we have been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And I would encourage you to take a, a Bible and uh, open it to the New Testament book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, and we will begin this evening uh, at verse 13. So we'll start tonight at Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. As we're coming toward the end of this, we have this week and then next week uh, before we wrap up the Sermon on the Mount to do that. So I would encourage you to open a, open a Bible there now as we begin to look at it, at it further. History of the, the history of the church has, has, has shown that it is, it is often spotted with false teachers. Uh, whether it be back in the days of the Bible, when the Bible was writ- written or the, the, actually lived out and then written afterwards, whether it be back in those days or all through history up until even the present days, there's, there's been spotted with uh, false teachers. Uh, more recently, we can think of uh, ones like David Koresh of the Branch Davidian sect that was in Waco, Texas, and uh, uh, the, the disaster that finished there. There was Jimmy Jones, who was in Jonestown, Guyana, of the uh, laced uh, Kool-Aid fame, um, uh, killed almost 900 of his followers through drinking laced Kool-Aid. Uh, and even uh, televangelist Jimmy Baker admitted himself, by his own admission, not being judgmental and not labeling him ourselves, but his own admission that he was uh, teaching a false doctrine of what he called the prosperity gospel. So we see where false teachers have been a part of the, of the church and and uh, false teachers and false prophets uh, throughout the ages. Uh, we found account, accounts of them in uh, the, the scriptures as well. Uh, but strange as it may sound, the church has benefited from the results, from the results of false teachers in that. There, there has been some benefit from, from uh, having false teachers or false prophets within, within the um, church. And, and how might the church have benefited from the influence of false teachers or false prophets? How might the church have benefited from the influence or the uh, influence or, or, or false teachers and false prophets? Uh, I'm going to give a brief moment of pause, but I won't wait uh, too long because I know there can be a considerable delay here and then we get the silent p- places like that. So if you want to just respond there at any time, or even if you have a question at any time, you can write your question there and I'll probably see them on the screen here. And uh, try to respond to them as I can. But uh, if you think of that one, how might the church have benefited from the influence of false prophets and false teachers? I would suggest that, that one way the church would have benefited from that is to, to challenge the church to know the truth and to stay to the truth. As false prophets, as false teachers have come in with their teachings, have, have come in with their false prophecy, it's challenged us to go back to the scripture and say, what does the scripture say? How does the scripture, how does this c- compare to what the scripture says? But I think if we were to really admit it, though, that the, the influence of uh, false teachers and, and false prophets has done more harm than good. Uh, the, there's been more harm than, than good done there. In, in verse 15 of chapter 7 here in Matthew, Jesus himself uh, says, he, he says, watch out for false prophets. Uh, it's addressed to all of us, so we need to watch out for false prophets. And there's maybe no time in history that has the church been more divided in uh, issues of doctrine and truth or moral issues than we see today. And now is the time that we really need to know, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus teach us? What does God teach us through his word? So I'm going to read our text for us this evening. Uh, and then we're going to look at it a little closer. So follow with me as I, I read for us from Matthew chapter 7, starting at the 13th verse. Jesus says towards the end of his Sermon on the Mount here, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit, good, good fruit is cut down, 
and thrown in, into the fire. Thus, by the, their fruit, you will recognize them. This is the word of God. Let's just have a word of prayer before I look a little closer at it. Father, as we come to the word that you have given to us, uh, help us to have uh, eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that respond to the truth of this word that you have for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why might people be likely to follow popular leaders or, or celebrities? What might be the reason that we'd follow people, popular leaders or, or celebrities? Or maybe to put it in the context of what we've read tonight, uh, why are the Broadgates and false teachers more appealing to the many people than they are to, to uh, fewer people? Why are the Broadgates and the false prophets appealing to so many people? give you a second to respond there as you look at that so feel free to respond in that well part of that when we look at that broad gates seemingly relieve us from making decisions or, or at least tough decisions if we have a broad gate we don't have to choose as much we can just kind of there's multiple choices we can we just uh, decide where we're going to go and go uh, the broad gates and the, the broad roads uh, they appear to give us a personal freedom and thus they can appear to give us a, a false impression that we're in charge of ourself. Um, maybe the charismatic leaders, as Linda says there, we can see that where, yeah, maybe it's a charismatic leader so we can be bent towards them. Uh, quite often these leaders are charismatic people, and I'll refer to that a little later, not necessarily charismatic, but uh, where these people have come from uh, as they look at that. But we'll see them there. They can be charismatic leaders. But but often we can we can also be inclined to follow them because they're charismatic leaders but also because the more choices we have, the, the more comfortable we feel. We don't have to ha have just the narrow choices. In verses 13 and 14, notice how the two gates are described here. And, and what one, one is broad and one is narrow. So when we see them here, what sticks about, uh, out about this is that there are only two choices. Uh, but it, somehow it seems that, that we as people, we as, as humans would like to make more choices. Uh, there's only a, two choices, a narrow or a wide. But we'd like to make more choices than that. But Jesus has said that there, there are but two choices. And we must choose one. We can't be no, neutral. It's not like we can ride the fence and say, well, whatever one. He's saying, as we looked at where there's two, two, he's given the impression here. You need to choose one or the other and follow one or the other to do that. Uh, in what way, when we see... in in what sense that the gate uh, of following Jesus is considered to be the narrow one. The gate of following Jesus is considered to be the narrow gate, the, 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 sorry, the narrow road that we have here. Uh, not the broad road, but the narrow road. The, the gate that is not wide, but the narrow gate. So what way is following Jesus considered to be the narrow way? I would suggest to us there as we think of a text like John chapter 14 verse 6 John chapter 14 verse 6 where Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me so when Jesus is the narrow way because he's saying he's really the truth he's the way he's the life nobody comes to the father except through him so it's just one way to get to the father and that's through him so he, he Jesus presents himself as the only way to get to God and so we either choose Jesus or we don't choose Jesus. And according to Jesus' teaching here, as we come to him, uh, as Lydia says, following God's word, no quick quick fixes through, through others. Yes, we need to follow God's word. It's not like we got multiple options on that. We follow God's word. Uh, Jesus is known as the word of God. And we follow after him uh, to, to do that. And follow, following after him. Thanks, Linda. So Jesus is presenting himself like we, we don't have a lot of choices. It's not like he's taking us into uh, Cole's bookstore and say, here, take your choice of what you're going to do. No, he's follow my word or follow me. There's, there's a narrow choice there. But we can see that the, the, the way of the world, uh, the, the wide gate, the, the gate, the gate that is wide and the road that is broad, there's plenty of room for diversity and opinions and open-mindedness and moral standards. Uh, it, it is the road of tolerance and permissiveness. 
uh, t- travelers on, on this road follow, follow their inclinations. That is the desires of their heart. You, you follow on the wide road, the broad road. Uh, you can, you can uh, the, the gate that is wide, the road that is broad. You follow through that, and it's basically, well, choose what you want to do. And in today's society especially, it's very hard to, to hold to the message of Jesus and not be considered as, a, a, at minimum, narrow-minded. As we, as we look at it as being uh, narrow-minded, if you, if you choose Jesus, you must be narrow-minded uh, because you're saying that's the only way. Where the way of the world says, no, no, there's multiple ways to do this, to live your life. Uh, and many of those ways, they'll take a bit of what the gospel says, a bit of what Jesus says, and a bit of what human philosophy says, and they'll, they'll combine it together to make it sound attractive. But Jesus is saying there's only one way to come to God, and that's through him. Now, I would suggest to us that probably people don't like the, 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 or dislike the notion that there is only one true, true way because it limits the choice of ourselves. It limits our own choices. We would rather make our own decisions. It's not like you can take door number one, door number two, uh, we're, we we kind of like say, well, can I have door number three or four or five? But there is no door number three, four or five. This is the, the, the narrow road or the wide road uh, to choose. Uh, somehow we have twisted the the, the notion of, of love and acceptance to mean condoning. Uh, we need to love everyone. We need to accept everyone. But we've twisted that to mean in today's world of, of condoning, saying, well, it's okay what you do. But if we follow the way of Jesus, that, that gets much more narrow. And, and uh, it, it, it's a harder road to follow when we do that. Well, next Jesus shifts the matter to the false prophets in verses 15 to 20. Uh, this is likely isn't done just by chance, but it's done deliberately. He doesn't shift it here when he goes from narrow, the narrow road and the wide gates and talk about those things in the narrow gates. He, he doesn't go from there. And then all of a sudden, uh, talk about false prophets. They're tied together uh, with, with this. So he, he shifts the metaphor here, uh, and he deliberately does it. One of the major characteristics of false prophets in the Old Testament is their unprincipled optimism, which insisted that God's way, way is really the broad way. Many of the false prophets of the Old Testament, what they warned against is saying, no, God's not really going to judge. You'll be okay. And really, it was leading the people down the very path they were trying to avoid. They were trying to avoid uh, the, dis- the judgment from God. And yet, these false prophets were coming along saying, Oh, God's not going to be like that. And it was le- they were le- the false prophets were leading the people into being judged by God. False prophets gave a false sense of security, uh, is what they were doing. Uh, they often begin, uh, began a slightly off-center and then started to wander more further as you did that. And I think it's surprising, even as we, we had some calls today, uh, Linda, when you mentioned earlier about uh, the, the charismatic leaders and things like that. Well, when we look at many of the cult, and, cult uh, both activists and member today, members today, we see where many of them began in solid Christian ministries, began with following after Jesus, and then began to wander one step at a time. They just didn't jump and le- leap out of their faith but they began to wander a bit at a time and wander away from that. Uh, it's surprising how many had that. Jesus says that the prophets come to you, these false prophets, sorry, come to you in sheep's clothing. Uh, the second part of verse 15 there, there, they come to you in sheep's clothing. False prophets are adept at blurring the truth. They're adept at blurring the truth. I think of two occasions. One was when the uh, the serpent tempted Adam and Eve. And uh, they said, we're not supposed to eat of that tree. And the serpent said, did God really say that? Did God really say that? And so they were t- the, the serpent was trying to twist what was being said. Uh, I think of when, when Jesus was being tempted. He was being tempted uh, after his baptism. He was led into the desert. And he was tempted there by the devil. And when he was tempted, uh, it was uh, take, taken to say, well, you could be, have a command over all this, or you could have rule over all this. And every single time, Jesus responded with the word of God. The, 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 the devil was trying to blur the truth, but Jesus held to the truth. Uh, as it relates to our salvation, uh, the false prophets will often do two things. They'll either make the, the, the road or the gate 
so broad for our salvation that we all think we're okay in God's eyes and we're going to be okay, or else they make it so narrow that nobody can find a way through it. Uh, some, some false prophets do that. They make it so strict and so narrow that nobody can fit through it, and then they gain control over people that way. Uh, when it states here that they come in sheep's clothing, uh, we need to remember that they aren't always obvious. These false teachers, the false prophets, they aren't always obvious. Uh, they don't just show up on the scene and say, Hi, I'm a false teacher. I'm going to lead you astray. No, when they come in, they re- they recognize that uh, they, they, they disguise, disguise themselves and they're not necessarily discernible right at the beginning. What we need to do is that what the Bible tells us is to t- test the spirits. First uh, John chapter four verse one. First John chapter four verse one says this: "Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether you, they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world." So it says, just because someone comes and says something, don't believe it. Test it. Follow it through. Test it. Uh, Jesus himself said, said that, especially in the last times, there would be an increase of false prophets, an increase of these false teachers. In Matthew chapter 24, we see that. We, we says, don't be surprised, particularly at the end times, where we see an increase of this. And I think we can uh, conclude from this that false prophets aren't going to go away. When Jesus says they're going to increase in number, he says, we can, I think we can safely conclude they're not going to go away. We're going to have them with us. So we need to have that spirit of discernment. Uh, and as I mentioned a minute ago, how did Jesus, when he was tempted in the desert by the devil, how, was, how did he respond? With the word of God. He responded with the word of God. So as we um, are exposed to these, these false teachers, we compare it with the word of God. Uh, we know they are false because they don't line up with scriptures. I had an occasion once where uh, somebody came to me and uh, said, the, the Lord has told me to do something. And so I, I talked to him about it. And actually, I was initially quite excited about what could potentially develop out of it. But as I talked further, I found out they were taking the word of God, the Bible. And they were, they were I wouldn't say twisting it, but they were misusing it. One of the things that they did is they, they said that God spoke to them through a particular verse in the Bible. And when I looked at that verse afterwards, that verse was actually spoken in condemnation of God's people, spoken by one of the prophets of the Old Testament, and it was spoken in condemnation of the people. So this person was saying, God's given this to me as my marching orders sort of thing to do the work that, that God has called, he's called me to do. But it was a verse that God had used in condemnation of people before. So he's not going to take a verse of condemnation and use it, quote, as a, as a commissioning verse. The other things that the, 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 the person said is, I know what I want to do is contrary to what Scripture would say is the, the standard practice of, of having this carried out. The procedure, it should be done through the leaders of the church. It should be done through this. But God's told me to do it instead. Well, as soon as you say, but to Scripture, I know what scripture says but then we're going to need to question that so we always need to come with false teachers we need to come back to uh, the scripture itself and say what does the scripture say are we taking scripture out of context are we taking it uh, so uh, putting a false meaning on it or a, uh, a, a false purpose to it and that's how we need to be careful with it there but false prophets are already also described here as ferocious wolves they come in sheep's clothing, but they are ferocious wolves. Wolves devour. Uh, wolves devour people. Uh, they're often responsible uh, for false prophets for, for leading people to destruction uh, that they often say that does not exist. Uh, the they, false prophet might, might say the, the destruction doesn't exist. It's not really true. It's not really happening. It's not there but they often lead them to that place of destruction uh, in, in what they're doing. So, and that's how they get devoured. That's how we get devoured. Well, twice Jesus says here in the latter verses that by their fruit we will recognize them. How do we recognize a false prophet? Is by their fruit. What, might have, what, what f- sort of fruit might we look for? If there's some things that we're looking in a false prophet for, what are some fruit that we might look for? Uh, respond to that if you want to. Uh, some things that you might see there of responding. 
uh, so so that you might think of when you think of a false prophet what might be some some from some fruit that we might be looking for from them to that would show hey that's bad fruit i would suggest a couple of things i would suggest we need to look at their character uh, are they are they acting independently of leadership uh let's their actions not matching the words exactly yeah their their character is not not uh uh is 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 showing faults in it the the character that they have and the, part of that character that we show when their actions don't match the words uh, they say one thing but they lead another there's many false prophets like that they declare one thing live like this live like this but yeah you see they live a different way he's not supposed to do that uh the fruit of the spirit is not evident and the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness long suffering those things and and i'm going to just jump on my bandwagon here for a moment well you mentioned fruit of the spirit lorene uh it's not fruits of the spirit it's not like we go to the grocery store and pick well i want a bit of this fruit a bit of that fruit it's all of the fruit together i can't say well i want some bit of joy and i want a little bit of love but that patience now you can keep the patience it's all of that fruit that we need to have so if we don't see the fruit manifested in their life is it the true gift that they're they're showing there? Uh, so we look at their character. We look at their the fruit that we the uh, fruit of the spirit that we see. Are their words matching their actions? Uh, their teachings. They'll often twist the truth, hold it to the truth. Where Jesus, uh, I go back to what he did during his temptation. He he when he went, he went to the truth of the word. What does the word say? When the serpent tried to te- test Adam and Eve, it was like, did God really say that? Well, what did the word say? Go back to the word. Uh, I said earlier one of the ch- one of the benefits that the church can have from uh, false prophets is that it, it should take us back to the word. What does the word say? Not what do I think? How do I feel? What is it supposed to be to me? No, it's what does the word say? What does the word of God say with that? Well, how can we keep from becoming false prophets or false? Uh, f- sorry, how can we keep from becoming accusers? or judgmental uh, as we seek to recognize false prophets. Linda said there, don't, don't we have to be careful of judging people by the, all, all the fruit? We are human. Okay, that's exactly where I was headed right now, uh, Linda. I was going to say, how can we keep from becoming false accusers or judgmental as we seek to recognize false pr- prophets? So, And that's a very real danger that we run. Uh, we don't want to be false, falsely accusing others or judgmental of others as we do that. Well, the application of the fruit test is not always, because the application of the fruit test is not always simple and straightforward that we see that. It, it's often this way because fruit takes time to ripen. So when we do have a, an opportunity to, uh, uh, with, with someone coming in, whether it be a false prophet or, or teacher or not a false prophet or teacher, it sometimes takes time for that fruit to ripen. So we need to be patient. Let's not be quick to this unless it's very obvious that it's going against the, the word of God. The, the, there's very obvious uh, steps in that if we see that. Because if we can go right away and say, hey, this doesn't line up with the word of God, we can say pretty well, okay, it's, it's, uh, um, that this is a false teaching. Now, when we say the fruit of the Spirit, um, we need to be careful because we, we don't want to become judgmental of that. Uh, when we look at things, but when I hear someone declaring truth and they're missing uh, love in their life, they're missing joy in their life. And I don't mean to say they always have to be full of oh, lovey-dovey and uh, huggy-wuggy and, uh, and joy of oh, isn't life wonderful. I'm not saying that at all. But when we see a lack of evidence of that fruit or actually a uh, fruit of the Spirit that's contrary to that, uh, maybe they're a divisive person or a vindictive person. Then we say that's contrary to the fruit. So we really need to be careful with that. Uh, as we are more grounded, we become more sensitive. Uh, it's, it's important to be praying to God for to give us a spirit of discernment. Help us to know that. I said to us uh, earlier where Jesus had said, I'm just going to look for that here. Uh, where I'm not seeing it. I am away in the truth. That's not the one I had. Jesus had talked about, I talked about where Jesus said there's going to be an increase in false prophets. I'm, I'm just forgetting the one scripture reference I, I mentioned here. Oh, okay, yes, there it is. 1 John 4, 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether you are from God. 
because many, whether they are from God, because many are false prophets and gone out into the world. Many more false prophets have gone out into the world. So it's saying test that. It doesn't mean jump to conclusions right away, but test it. And the greatest test we can do, we, we can do is uh, bring it before the, the, the scriptures, bring it before the Bible and say, how does the Bible compare to this? Uh, and as we become more grounded in the word, as we become more mature in our faith, we become more sensitive to that. Uh, so, sometimes looking at a tree, we can tell it's an apple tree. But what we can't tell is what kind of apple. Is it a Macintosh? Is it a Spartan? Is it a whatever? Uh, we can look at a cherry tree and, and tell, it, okay, it's a cherry tree. But is it, is it a Bing? Is it a whatever kind of uh, cherry? So we need to be um, mature in, in, in our decision making when we do that, not just uh, flippantly with it. Uh, we need to pray for discernment. We need to be patient. Uh, we need to seek out spiritual leaders, uh, not just take it upon ourselves, uh, as opposed to just, uh, if you want to say, have friends having a gossip session, that we need to, to uh, seek out spiritual leaders. Examine the person's character, and I don't mean be judgmental of it, but look at it for the fruit. Examine the conduct, the message, the motives, the influence that they're having. Are these things lining up with the Word of God? Are they submitting to the leaders over them? We, we've, we've talked about submission, uh, both on Sundays and on Wednesdays over the past month or so. Are these people being submissive? Are they, are they practicing uh, what, what they're supposed to be preaching? And so, yes, we don't want to be too quick to be, quote, judging in this. We're not called to judge. God is a judge. But we need to be discerning. But we need to be careful in that discernment of it as well. Um, there's a strong warning that we see right at the end of this. that happens to the trees that we see there. It says in verse 19, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. So it reminds us again by the fruit. But it says what, what happens here to those, those trees that do not bear good fruit? They'll be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, who's doing the cutting down? Who's throwing into the fire? I will say God is doing the cutting down. God is doing the, the throwing into the fire. That's not up to us to do it. But what I, I want to look at this verse from the perspective of not from, okay, what's going to happen to these people? Uh, serves them right. I want to look at it from the perspective of it should be a caution to each of us, uh, both to avoid fa false prophets, yes, but maybe even more so not to become one. Not to become a false prophet to do that because the stern warning that is given there that we see. And it's not us that, that does it. It's not believers that do this judgment and do the cutting down and throwing into the fire. But it is God who is responsible to do this. So as we've looked at this, and we can see that following the way of Jesus is not necessarily the easy way. It's the narrow road, as it says, where there is a wide road you can take, but it leads to destruction, as our verses remind us of this. But Jesus calls us to say, He is the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. We need to use Him as our standard to measure. Him as our, our, if you want to call it a plumb line. A plumb line is a straight line that runs down that you know is running level. And you take all the measurements from it. We need to use Him as a standard. Not ourselves as a standard. Not, our, not even if you want to say, my own interpretations as a standard. We need to use Jesus Himself as that standard. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word again tonight. And I, I pray, Father, for a couple of things. I pray, first of all, that we would not be deceived by false teachers, false prophets, and try to live the life of the, the wide road, but we would try to live that narrow road of following after Jesus and doing what Jesus said. But I pray, Father, as well, that not only that we would not get caught in following after a false prophet, false leader, but that we would not become false prophets, false leaders ourselves. Uh, that, Father, we would hold true to your word and not try to make your word fit our life, make your word fit our belief, make your word fit our comfort zones, but that, Father, your word we would follow after and that we would be like Jesus. But what does the word of God says? The word of God says, and we follow after that word of God. So thank you, Father, for these, these words from Jesus' first recorded sermon and help us to apply them in our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us tonight and we look forward to uh, meeting, uh, gathering again next Sunday for our final study in the Sermon on the Mount. 
I think where I'm going to go after that, the final study, is to uh, looking at some characteristics of God through that we see through the Psalms. About half a dozen of the Psalms will look at the characteristics of God. But just as a reminder, 11 o'clock Sunday morning, we have our in-person services again have started. We've had two so far, and we'll continue again this week. And this week's theme is going to be, uh, what if you knew the world was going to end tomorrow? What if you knew the world was going to end tomorrow? What would you do today? Well, what if you knew the world was going to end tomorrow? What would you do today? That's going to be our theme on Sunday. And just as a reminder that if you don't come out on Sunday because you're either not comfortable yet in a, in a public gathering or you don't live in the area, that we're going to be live streaming through Facebook Live on the Brant Naz uh, group page right here where you got the study tonight. And so we'll uh, have that go live and then a recorded version of it will be available afterwards. So Lord bless you, Lord keep you, and have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.